I'm not sure why we didn't think about this sooner, but we have been sprinkling Coat Defense's daily preventative powder on Tucker's dog bed, and both he and his bed stay fresher. We love this daily powder that acts like a dry shampoo and works to eliminate odor and repel dirt. With all the rain we've had this spring, I hate that wet dog smell, and Coat Defense combats odors with a chemical-free formula that prevents the yeast that causes a stinky dog. I think you'll love this powder, and you can try it for 15% off by using code MAMA15 when you check out at CoatDefense.com. Well, you may have heard that women over the age of 30 should be using a nightly retinoid, but did you also know that we should be using a vitamin C serum? Well, during the day, it helps to protect your skin from future damage and boosts the efficacy of your sunscreen. Using vitamin C serum at night helps to promote collagen production, which of course we all need. And I've been using the Bareface Liquid Gold Vitamin C Serum morning and night for several months now, and I've noticed such a difference in my skin since I started incorporating it into my routine. I cannot recommend this product enough. I love it. You can get 15% off your purchase when you use the code MAMA15 at barefaced.com. You guys know that my favorite things I have from Able are truly staples for me. There's my leather crossbody bag, the backpack that I carry for work, of course that denim jacket I wear all the time. My friends have it. I love it. Almost all of my everyday jewelry pieces are also from Able. I just feel good wearing them because I love the mission behind this company to support and empower women from all walks of life. I recently got to meet their brand new female CEO, Misty Blasco. She's bringing 25 years of experience working working in fashion and retail with companies like All Saints, True Religion, BCBG. And to celebrate this exciting announcement, you can use my code MAMA30 and receive 30% off of your entire purchase at Able. The website is ableclothing.com. Search the word Jennifer and you're going to see the items that I have handpicked just for our Got It From A Mama listeners. That is code MAMA30. Welcome back, everybody. I feel privileged to share this special episode with Amber Smith. Amber is the wife of Granger Smith, best known as a country music artist and now seminary student, which you'll hear more about in this episode. But Amber and Granger lost their three-year-old son, River, in a backyard drowning accident several years ago. And since that time, this sweet couple has used this tragedy to share their story of resiliency, hope, and faith, as well as to raise awareness for child swim safety. They're just incredible people, and Amber's heart as a mother who has dealt with unimaginable loss is really inspiring. I hope you enjoy this episode and that maybe you'll share it with someone who could use a dose of hope today. One of the things I think is interesting about getting to talk to you today is I've often thought with a young son in country music, my um, son Connor Smith is an artist, but I've always thought he's such a strong person of faith. And if he could have a career that emulated Granger's Mm. and he was able to be outspoken about his faith and still so relatable to his audiences, everything that that would surely be something to be proud of. Granger's just a special guy. And I know you guys have been on such a special journey, but I just wanted to pay that compliment to him. Oh, thank you. That's really sweet. Thank you. Tell him, I mean, he can, he can, he has, God has given him a platform and a stage so he can proclaim the good news. That's exactly right. So tell me a little bit about um, you as a teenager. Where did you grow up? I love how you've kind of been vulnerable about your story. You weren't the most confident young lady. You were not, um, had not taken like big steps in your faith to become Mm -hmm. the woman that you are at that point in life. So tell me a little bit about Amber as a younger girl. I would say that she was very, very lost. Mm -hmm. Um, I, where do I even start? Um, I, I grew up um, in Fort Worth, Texas, and my parents were divorced when I was five. So um, I have a wonderful stepdad, um, but I I think I just was still always searching for who I was and didn't know my identity in Christ. And I sought love in all the wrong places and um, was just very into in sin and and lost. And I went to the youth group, you know, nights and things like that. But I think I only went to socialize and have my, because my friends were there, I wasn't truly, um, going to know Jesus. And so, yeah, she was a mess. Amber was a teenage mess, but thankfully the Lord kept pursuing me and kept placing people in my life to plant those seeds along the way. Um, and, and it, they did their work. And I think that's something a lot of girls can relate to, of kind of going to church to go through the motions or for the social interaction, but maybe not really growing in the way that they, that they could. 
at, at that stage of life. So you did not really grow in your faith until after you met Granger, right? Right, right. I, we, um, he was traveling a lot for his, for his job. So I, we, you know, we had, we had kids and I've really felt when we, when we first got married, that, that was kind of the first time that we, you know, we made a vow before God. And I didn't even know if I would ever get married just because there was so much divorce in my family, mm-hmm. but I knew that I wasn't going to get married unless it was forever. And so when I married Granger, I knew it was going to be forever. And about that point is when we started thinking, you know, we, we, we need to start thinking about, you know, church, but then his, his career took off. We had kids and we just didn't find a church home for a really long time. And I started feeling conviction. Um, I guess about the time, maybe 2016 was when we had river and, I would make excuses for all those years before, like, I don't want to go without my husband or, or I don't, I don't want to have to go by myself and take all my kids. It's just too hard. And they were all just excuses, all excuses. <laughs> and so um, the, the, I had good Christian women in my life inviting me to church and I finally, finally decided to go. And um, I went to really good Christian women's conferences. I was reading devotionals and really started to feel, you know, that our life was going in a good direction. I was going to, I was beginning to give my kids the fr- the foundation that I didn't have um, for a long time growing up. And, and it started to seem like everything was going in the right direction. Yeah. And so how was Granger able to join alongside you with that commitment? Was it difficult because he was on the road and traveling? He actually didn't go with us um, until after we lost River because he was gone. I mean, he was just gone all, all the time on Sundays. So whenever we had River Celebration of Life, it was the church that I had been going to. Um, so that's kind of, that was kind of his first taste of church all as a family. And that's the church that we kind of made our home with was where we had our Celebration of Life for our son. Wow. That's interesting how that kind of catapulted what has ended up being this really interesting faith journey, special faith journey for you guys and your entire family and the kids and all of that. Tell us kind of the fun story. I love how you and Granger met. (laughs) Um, So it's very cliche, but I, I, we met on the set of his first music video and I played the girlfriend. And so we hung out all day, um, acting like we were dating. We had a fake fight. We made cookies. We danced by outside on the patio. Um, and then when I left, I just knew that I felt something more than just acting. And so I reached out to him a short time later and just asked him if he possibly felt the same thing. Um, some things took place. We ended up waiting about a month uh, to get together and have coffee. And then we were together ever since. That's so sweet. I love that. You were you were the girl in the music video. He ended up marrying the girl in the music video. He did. Yeah. And our first our first day that we ever met is on camera. So it's really neat. Oh, time. yeah. There you go. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. I mean, you kind of jumped right in there. You were doing all the couples things all in one day. It's almost like you got to test it out and like, okay, this actually feels pretty good. So Yeah, we did. We did. And that's what like I left that night and I told my friend that I felt something and she was like, no, you didn't. You, you guys were just living like, you know, living like you were a couple or acting like you were a couple. This is just acting. You're going to be over this tomorrow. <laughs> I don't think so. You couldn't really get them off your mind, huh? No, I couldn't. Yeah. What were your career aspirations at the time? So before you got into this lifestyle that kind of dominates, you know, daily life and all of that being on the road, but what were you hoping to do? I knew I always wanted to be a mom. Um, I knew that that's something I always wanted, but but career wise, I thought I was going to be an entertainment reporter for E News. There you go. Okay, <laughs> I went, similar aspirations. I love it. Yeah, I went to school for broadcasting, um, so I have a degree in broadcasting, which I guess I kind of use now. You know, as much as I talk, but yeah, I ended up getting into acting after I uh, graduated college and just started doing commercials and little music videos and things on the side, and really fell in love with that. Yeah. And you always wanted a big family. Yeah. I don't know that I, I mean, yeah, I knew I wanted kids. I didn't know how many, um, I think we always thought we would have three. That was kind of always our number. So is, let's see, Lincoln, the oldest London London's the oldest. Okay. So you had a girl first and how old is she now? She's 12. She's in sixth grade. Oh my goodness. You're about to hit those middle school girl, those middle school years. I know. And we're already going through it. Uh, kind of all the middle school girl drama, hormones, all the things. Oh, it is. It's a journey, right? (laughs) And then you had a boy next. Yes. We had Lincoln. He's 10 now. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, River was next. Yeah. We have Little yes. River. Yep. Yeah. Three. And so at the time you thought you were done, right? We did. Yeah. And you know, we tied my tubes, thought we were done. We, we th- thought we had our life all planned out the way we thought we would have it. Mm. And it didn't, your, our lives do not always go as we plan. Yeah, for sure. So let's go back to June of 2019. One, I just really appreciate how vulnerable you guys have been really from 
it, it feels like very early after the accident. I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but it sounds like you um, were, I imagine at some point there was a conversation where we're going to, there's a purpose in this and we're going to use this somehow. And you just immediately began blessing other people by sharing your story. Tell me about that decision that you made after you did lose River to really pour into other people that may have either been on a similar journey or I know also awareness is a big part of your platform as well. But tell me about kind of what you felt led to do. Well, it's funny you say that because you said a decision was made um, pretty soon after and it was actually while River was in the operating room when we donated his organs. I mean, it was that soon that we walked outside of the hospital and, you know, we looked at each other and Granger said, you know, we can't let, can't let this Tara family apart. And, you know, he'll tell in interviews that we kind of made this like unromantic decision where we like shook hands and said that we were going to, we were going to just stick this out. Um, and, you know, I guess maybe it might sound that way. It might sound unromantic, but that, but that was the vow we made, you know, for better or for worse. And we're not going to let anything tear us apart. And, we still love each other and we still have other children that, that deserve a childhood. And while yes, this is hopefully the worst thing we will ever face. We're going to look for the good in it and we're going to bring good from it. And we're going to find meaning instead of wrestling over all the reasons. Um, and so we already had a family YouTube channel prior to losing river. And, you know, we had a decision, we could shut it all down and go away, or we could walk this out in front of people and, really show the vulnerability of walking through grief and what it looks like for a family and what it looks like in a marriage. And it was, it showed the raw ups and downs. And, um, I think that really resonated with people. I think so many people feel so alone and you feel like nobody is going through what you're going through. So we just wanted to be kind of an open book as to everything that we were facing and that it was okay to feel every single emotion that you're feeling. For people who aren't as familiar with your story, get back to that day and um, what uh, was, were the kids at home at the time? Everyone, yes, yeah. yeah, everyone was home. Um, Granger reminded me of this, and I it's it's funny what what happens to your brain in those trauma moments. You, I think God protects you in some ways, and you forget some things. But He reminded me that I had had a really long, stressful day as a mom, you know, and I was I was I was we had had dinner. I got River out of his high chair. He was already in his PJs. I was going to put him to bed. But London wanted to go outside and, and show Granger this new routine that she had for gymnastics. And so the boys, of course, wanted to follow. And so they all went outside. And at one point, I was kind of cleaning up dinner. And at one point, I went outside and Granger said, can you take the boys inside? Like, I think they were annoying her, shooting her with water guns. And in my tired frustration, I said, I just need a minute. Can I go take a shower? And I didn't take the boys inside. And so I wrestled with that for a long time, but I went in and, and took my shower. And then, um, I mean, I take short showers. It was probably five minutes as a mom, if that. And, and when, as soon as I got out, I heard my daughter scream. And all I could hear was the words river and pool. So I, in my mind, I was thinking he must have just fallen in. I don't know how he did. We had a huge iron fence around the gate. I don't know what happened. I don't know where Granger is. So I started running and I just screamed, I screamed, where's daddy? But by the time I, I kind of got those words out of my mouth, um, I saw Granger already doing CPR on him inside the pool gate. And so we, we took turns doing CPR for about, I don't know, 10 minutes or so till the ambulance got there and they ended up uh, getting his heartbeat back. So we thought he was going to be okay. We truly thought, oh my gosh, like we he's going to make it. He's going to make it. This was just a scare. But when we got to the hospital after about 24 hours in, they said that there was no brain activity that, that he would never, he would never wake up. It took about 24 hours for yeah. that message to come. Yeah. Which was shocking. I mean, I don't even think it was 24. It might've been, it might've been like 14. It was soon. And I was so confused. I was thinking, you know, when the doctor came in, he said 0% chance. And I said, I said, there's not even 1%. There's not even like a half percent. Because if there is, you know, we're going to fight. But he said 0%. He said he's not going to He's not gonna wake up. He's not going to open his eyes. So I remember Granger looking at the doctor and saying, because we had to make the decision when to take life support off and everything. And he said, would, when, would, would you... Would you unhook your son? And the doctor, you know, he he had a tear in his eye and he said, I would. So the donation thing kind of made things um, stretch out longer, which was good. Um, just by any chance, if he happened to, you know, if God happened to do a miracle and he happened to just revive him or wake him up in some way, 
Um, so we were in the hospital another two days for the organ donation. And um, was that an easy decision for you guys when you when they came to ask you that? They see the funny thing is they didn't ask. I I I had always known you know as a teenager or, an, or young adult I would be an organ donor. It was just always something I put on my card. I just always thought. Why, why I don't need my organs if I'm not here, just give them to somebody. Why wouldn't you? Uh-huh. Yeah, and and in that moment after they said that he wasn't going to make it, I just I just started crying and I said we I said I want to donate his organs and I said if we can't have our miracle, I want somebody else to be able to. I want somebody else to be able to bring their baby home. And so that made it last another I guess another 24 to 48 hours looking for recipients. I had peace. I had peace in this ho- in the hospital that could only come from the Lord. But after they took him back for surgery, they came back in and said, you know, when they removed all the breathing tubes and everything, he only breathed for a couple minutes and then he passed. So mm-hmm. I knew that he wasn't going to come back. Mm-hmm. It's still so raw this many years later. It, it, yeah. it is. It's always, I mean, the Lord has done such a healing in our life, but it's always right below the surface, you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I have, you know, that first year, I think I cried every single day. And, you know, five years down the road, I, I cry, um, I get emotional, but God has been so good and so faithful in, in my healing. But when I talk about him or when I tell the story, it's still always right there. And I talk to women 20 years, 20, 30, 60 years down the road, and they still have tears in their eyes when they talk about their baby or, or whoever their loved one is that they that they lost. One of the things, um, and I don't know if it was in your bio or where, where I read it, but I le- you said that God made himself known to me in a way that completely changed my life yeah. through this journey. Yeah. Did you feel his presence from the time that this accident happened, the way that he was holding you and providing a sense of peace, even in the middle of this tragedy? I did. I knew, I knew when I came out to the pool and I saw a river that he was gone. I knew, I knew it. I knew he was with Jesus. Even though they got the heart beat back, I, I knew he was gone. Wow. And in the hospital, I had such a peace. I was so calm, you know, in a moment where you think you would be screaming and, and crying and wailing. I wasn't. I was very calm. And, and I'm sure I was in shock too, but I felt this peace that could only come from the Lord. And Granger later told me he felt that same peace. And, you know, I laid with River and I, I, I said, um, I said, if you can fight, you know, I whispered in his ear, I said, if you can fight, I want you to come back to us. But if you can't, I can give you back. And I wouldn't, I wasn't even a Christian at that point. So it's like, how did I have those words to say that I could give you back to the Lord? It was just, and then he, sh- he showed us all kinds of things in the hospital, um, just little signs and things throughout and just really gave us a calm all throughout those days and weeks and months following losing river. And yeah, he just revealed himself to me and I just felt so close. I mean, the, the Bible says the Lord is so close to the brokenhearted and I just, I felt it. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like the Lord's, um, that peace he gave you and kind of that, that in, instinct of, of, I guess the strength that was holding you up, was it also why you didn't go into a mode, which would seem as a wife and a mother, so natural to, to be mad at Granger or where was he or things that would have really caused a bitterness there that, that you somehow did not allow to creep in? No, I didn't. And I, and I keep telling everybody that's only by the grace of God, because I even had friends, you know, who were like, I don't know what I would have done. I think I would have been angry. And I just, in that moment, there wasn't a, a where were you or a, or a whose fault it was. It was, we're both fighting for our baby. Like this is both our baby. Both of us are grieving. Both of us are hurting. Um, and it was also kind of a blessing that we were both there. We were never there most of the time at the same time. And so it was a blessing that, that God placed us both there during the most traumatic moment of our lives. We didn't have to go through it alone. We were both home. Um, yeah, I, I just, I never felt that. And I can only say that's just by the kindness of God. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just kind of in awe of how suddenly that you realized that you were going to use this to, you know, use your valley to bless other people. I just am so like, I mean, only God, right? Like yeah. that's what it makes me think of that, you know, he was like, not only am I going to carry you through this, but I'm going to give you the strength to use this to help other people. 
I simply cannot stop looking at all of the beautiful pictures from Connor and Leah's wedding. All the details were so perfect, including the awesome suits that Connor and the groomsmen wore. We ordered from suitshop.com and paid less to own and keep the suits than what we would have paid to rent them. They also have tuxes and so many color options, fit options, and everything was done online. Suit Shop managed the entire process for our group and they just couldn't have made it any easier. One of the groomsmen sent me a text last week to tell me that he has worn his suit twice since last month's wedding and another ordered two more for work because the fit was so perfect. Visit suitshop.com, use the code GIFMM for Got It From My Mama and get a free tie with purchase. One of the things that I love about Abel is how they celebrate women every day. From the women who make their beautiful jewelry or design the luxe leather bags and fashionable clothing, Abel provides an opportunity for change. I love this company's mission. Abel celebrates the strength, resilience, and beauty of all women and are offering Got It From My Mama listeners 30% off their purchases site-wide when you use the code MAMA30. Celebrate the women in your life with a gift from Abel or just treat yourself. Where you are, as you are, Abel celebrates you. Can you tell me some, um, or just share some instances that have just meant so much to you? Of course, now you're even speaking, and I think there's a book in the works, and I read Granger's book. It was so beautiful and really helped someone to understand your story more, and it's about so much more than even the incident with River. It's just a super encouraging, beautiful book. Um, But tell me about some of the things, maybe encounters that you've had with other people that you've been able to um, pray with, share your story, those kind of things of how it has helped others. I mean, I, I have had countless in walking through this, we have had countless um, people that we are like, we had a, a family from Iowa that just came in last week that we were able to sit down and, and help minister to. And we met with another family from Dallas who lost a son just a couple of days later. So we're constantly, God has placed us in so many people's vicinity to share the comfort that he gave us. Mm-hmm. But I think one of the first ones, um, and it, it's in Granger's book as well is, you know, Granger had a best friend from his twenties and Shortly after we lost River, you know, his friend called him and was just sobbing. And he was like, I don't know why I can't shake this. You know, it was you that lost your son. I don't know why I can't shake this. I'm just so heartbroken for you. And a couple of weeks later, his nephew drowned. His nephew passed the same way at a birthday party. So we were able to just just a couple months after we lost River, we were able to go into that hospital, the same hospital, the same halls, the same smells everything and be with that family and pray with them and walk alongside them. And, and God has done such a beautiful work in our families where now they go to our church now. I mean, it's just, he's just meshed us all together. And so that was a really special moment for us to, to witness to another family. And then now um, you speak, and I'm sure this is part of, of your story, but just in sharing your testimony and um, what's that been like for you? To, I mean, you're actually getting on planes and flying. I mean, I think you go to Canada soon. So yes. like those kind of things. What's that been like? Is there a healing property to that for you? There is. It's something I never thought I would do. I, I am not the one who is good with a microphone. I am not the one who ever could stand up in front of a crowd and, and speak. I still get ner- I still get so nervous, and I have to remind myself, that God has brought me to this place. And I, and I said, when we lost river that I was just going to say, yes, wherever you want me to go, Lord, I will go for you. And he's really just been placing on my heart these past few months, sing my praises, sing my praises. Mm -hmm. And so as much as it's not my comfortability, you know, to be able to get up and speak in front of people, it is healing because I know that so many people are suffering. And when I was walking through it, I wanted to hear from other people who had gone through it and come out on the other side, yes. still praising the Lord um, and and have a sense of healing and also have joy again mm-hmm. because we're not meant to stay stuck. And I want to I want to just show people that you can have joy and there is hope and this is not the end of your story. So each time it is a little bit, um, a little tiny bit of healing for me. And I love talking about River. I love, I love my son so much. And he taught me so much in three years that I love to be able to share that with so many people. He was a little spunky thing, wasn't he? He lived up with red hair. Yes. Yes. He was such a little, a little firecracker and he did everything fast. And I feel like in his spirit, he knew he would only be here for a short time because everything was fast. Everything was dangerous. Everything was, he always would tell me, you know, if he was doing something that was dangerous and I would tell him to get down, he would say, shh, it's okay. It's okay. Like, like, okay. (laughs) 
but he just, yeah, everything was full throttle. He had to get it all in in three years. One of the things that I think is especially special about your story is your message that, and I think so many people need to hear it, but that grief and joy can coexist. And I'm guessing there's no more ultimate representation than that of that than the birth of Maverick. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. You had your tooth tied. So take me to how this even, I'm going to guess this is an only God moment as well, right? Yeah, it was, we had our, I had my tubes tied. And um, so when Granger came to me not long after we lost River and asked if I would want to have another baby, I, my first thought was no, I, I don't think I could. I think it would be a betrayal. I don't know how I could have another baby after burying our child. And, but we prayed about it and, you know, God kind of taught me something through that moment that he doesn't only speak to me, that he speaks through my husband, you know, he speaks to my husband as well. So we, we prayed about it. We called my doctor. We had two options. I could try to untie my tubes, which, you know, costly might not work. Um, you know, all the things, or I could do IVF since I never had trouble getting pregnant before they would just take both of our pieces and implant it into, into my belly. Um, and so we, we prayed hard about that because I struggle with IVF um, as a Christian. You know, how how could we play God? And Granger talked about that in the book as well. Mm-hmm. But Granger really felt something strongly from the Lord that led us to that decision. So we ended up doing IVF. Um, I had a miscarriage. We got pregnant once. I, I lost that baby at nine weeks. And then we had the second embryo that that we had, and and now we have little Maverick. Like you said, your initial reaction was no, I'm not going to have another baby. It feels like a betrayal. Um, is it one of those moments where once the baby was here and born, you immediately knew the purpose of this this experience as well, and it kind of helped you to deal with some of those thoughts you had? Yeah, it, I mean, and I would even say, you know, our son had a dream. Our, he was five at the time. Um, and he came to me one day and said that he had a dream about River and that River said that everything was going to be okay and that we were going to have another baby. And I said, I said, we're, another baby? And he said, yes, a baby brother. We're going to have another baby brother. And we were already going through the process at the time, but we had never said anything to the kids because we didn't want to get their hopes up or anything. And so when he said that, I was like, okay, okay. Wow. That's no, awesome. and I just, I, I felt a peace that if we were supposed to have this baby, we would. And if we weren't, we would know. And we would know that River was our last and we would have peace about that too. Um, so I just, I had just at that time fully surrendered my life to, to Christ. And I just was, had my hands open like, okay, Lord, you're going to do what you're going to do or you're not. And I will trust you through it. Um, and then having that grief and joy when he was born, that was probably the highest moment of grief and joy that I, that I had ever had because I was so happy so thankful, so blessed to be holding this new baby, but also I was so sad and still grieving, you know, the loss of river and, and plus all the hormones and everything. It was oh, just, I can't imagine grief and joy, you know, I would, I would rock him and just sob, um, but I was so joyful. So, you know, yeah, that was a big grief and joy moment for me. Yeah. What a gift he was to your yeah. family and is, how old is he now? Yes. He's, he's all, gosh, he's a little over two and a half. So he's going to, oh. He's going to pass River this year, which is going to be kind of our last, I guess, milestone that you think about um, is he'll be older than River was, which will be strange. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's already starting to, he and River have so much in common. So they're so alive. Are their personalities similar? Is he more like the older two? No, they're, they are the, they are the most similar of my four kids. Okay. Lincoln's very different. Lincoln's into sports and he was always into playing with like little action figures and things. Mm-hmm. Maverick and River love to be outside, love to be in the dirt, love to explore, love tractors and, and cars and trucks. And they even sound the same. And, and from the back, they look the same. Like if he had red hair, very similar in how they look. And that's a blessing. And also, you know, it stings a little bit, but it's also so sweet that I get to kind of see glimpses of River still through yeah. his through his little brother. Yeah, it's almost like a little gift, but I'm sure I bet you do have moments of like, oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah because they I are- have moments that catch me off guard sometimes. I'm like, oh, that yeah. is sounds exactly like River, or that that look you just gave me was exactly him. Yeah. <laughs> what are some of the intentional ways in your family that you keep um River's memory active and alive, because I have no doubt that that is probably very important to you. Yeah, not, I mean, we, we never took pictures down. I know a lot of families when they're grieving, they will take every photo down. They'll just close their door, never go in. Mm -hmm. We just, 
made him such a big part of our family. And he, and, you know, we told the kids, he's always a part of our family and we can talk about him and we can watch videos. And, but we also told them if it hurts you, we'll take him down. But we just still talked about him in everyday conversation. We still watch videos of him. Um, he just never, it's like he never really left. I mean, obviously physically he did, but right. now a few years down the road, they're able to, to see videos and laugh all the time. And um, he's just still such a big part of our lives. I love that. Yeah. You guys had to make a really big decision to leave that home. Um, am I right that you had built it? It was kind of the dream home. It was where you thought you would raise the, the kids. We didn't build it, but we we searched for that little pocket of land for a long time, and it was just where we had all of it. We we raised our children from you know from that up until you know London. I guess London was seven, um, and we loved it. We loved the land. We were always outside. It was just a little perfect quote worldly perfect place for us. Right. And so about a month after um, we lost him, we just realized we couldn't be good parents to our other kids still facing that pool every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, Granger would drive his truck right up to the pool when he came home from work and Lincoln would want to be playing baseball outside, but the pool was 10 feet away. It just messed with our heads. And so we thought if we're going to be the best parents for our children, we need to start fresh. We need to get away from this place. And so we moved into like a temporary place for about a year where we could just rest and pray. And then um, we built a house um, on the land that we're on now. And we lived in an RV during the time we were, it was being built. So that was a really special time for us to be really close together. And mm -hmm. I told Granger the other day, we're, we're on year five. I was walking around and it's spring. I love spring. All the wildflowers are out. And I said, I finally feel like we're home again. Right. You know, it took, took five years, but I finally feel like, finally feel settled and feel home. I love that. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about um, the decision and kind of what that was like in your marriage. And I mean, music had always been such a big part of Granger's identity. Um, you guys as a couple, you were rocking that life of balancing kids and family and you carrying that weight and he's out on the road and all of that. Tell me about the talks that you had that led up to a really big decision for Granger. I think I could tell after, because he went to work very quickly after we lost River because he had you know, 12 guys on salary. Um, he kind of just had to keep going. And I think he also just wanted to get his mind off of things and try to get back into a normal routine. But I could tell when he went back that it wasn't the same. I mean, when, when you go through a loss like that, it just opens your eyes to what's important and the stage and the award shows and all the things just didn't matter anymore. They didn't have the same, they didn't make him feel, um, the way that they used to. Right. And while he loved his fans, I mean, they were, they were stuck by us through everything. He was just like, I just don't think I'm going to do this anymore. And then we started getting into speaking um, when people started asking us our story and started, you know, we read the Bible cover to cover and just started really realizing that there's a greater message that needs to be told. And um, so one day he was like, I think I'm just going to end it this year. And this was like uh, October. He's like, I think I'm just going to end it in January. And I was like, no, you're not. You've been doing this for too long. You're not going to just quit just like that. Yeah. And I said, you need to at least do like a goodbye tour and say goodbye. And, you know, he enrolled in seminary and, and he did his last tour. And then now he's on mission trips, sharing the gospel and he's in seminary. And he, it's just the Lord just completely changed our entire lives. And is he still in seminary now? He is. Yeah. He is. Wow. He is. Would you have ever imagined, let's think about, you know, the girl in the video and Granger dating young married couple and all that. Would you have ever imagined that you guys would be working in ministry? No, no, we were such sinners. Absolutely not. No, we were so we still are, right? <laughs> we all are. Yes, we are. We were so living of the world, and I never would have thought that this is where we would be. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. Only yeah. God. Only God. Yes. yes. <laughs> That's amazing. So he is um, traveling a whole lot still, right? But mostly on mission trips and things. Connor said he spoke at the Believer's Breakfast this year during the big CRS seminar that they have in Nashville for country music and said it was absolutely incredible. And just the impact that he is having, you know, to the world that he just took a step out of is still so awesome. And then now he's impacting all of these other people who may not have ever even heard of Granger Smith. You know, that's just incredible what he's doing with the faithfulness that you guys have shown through this. Yeah. I think it's really cool that God has allowed him to go back into his people, so to speak, you know, yeah. into the genre of music and, and share with them. And then he's walking with a couple of musicians, you know, through some hard times right now. And, trying to witness to them. And so I think it's really beautiful that God kind of does like a full circle 
yeah. the circle thing. Yeah. yeah, I could definitely see him playing a role in, you know, because he knows and he's walked it. But, you know, it's a very, very difficult life. Yeah. You know, as I'm sure you have, what were the, what were the tough days like of you as a young mom at home and he's out with the Doring fans, you know, on stage. And uh, did you handle all of that? Well, was it difficult to have a husband on the road at that stage? Uh, it wasn't difficult. Like we, we trusted each other. I wasn't worried about anything happening. Um, I would say my hardest times when I had, were when I had three kids under five and like, right, like right now, uh, they were all sick or all, you know, yeah. had a stomach bug at the same time and I'm exhausted. And, um, <laughs> You know, I think those were the hardest times was that, you know, moms don't really ever get breaks and thankfully right. have an amazing mother in love and my mom would, would come and help. But I think those were the hard times is when you're just so stretched when, you know, when you have multiple children all within a short little age um, gap, they all need something at 24 hours a day. One of them's sick, one of them's crying, one of them's hungry. So that was when I was stretched, probably the thinnest. For yeah. sure. When couples go through a tragedy such as the one that you did, so often I think the stats are definitely weighed toward the marriage not lasting. Like it has such a greater impact. Mm -hmm. What would you say, I'm going to guess it has something to do with your face, but was the number one thing that you would share with other people that really got you through as a couple through what you went through? I would say just to have grace for how the other one is grieving. Mm -hmm. Um for a long time, Granger could not look at photos of River. He couldn't hear his voice. He, he didn't really want to talk about him. Whereas I wanted to talk about him all the time. I wanted to see videos. I wanted to hear his voice. So I couldn't get mad at him because he didn't want to see a picture or something because that hurt him. And so I think just having grace for each other and realizing that both of you are probably not going to be on the same wavelength most days. One of you is going to be doing okay. The other one's not right. just trying to um, show up for them in the best way that you can be there for them. The best way you can back off whenever, you know, you're, you're feeling like you need to back off um, and just pray, pray for them as they're walking through that. Cause it's, it's, it is, it's really hard and it's, it's um, not the norm for people to, to stick it out together. Right. One of the things that you guys have done so beautifully together is really raise awareness for infant swim rescue. And I guess was, did that come to you also with that passion of um, we're going to use this message and share with other people? Was that immediately part of your message or is it something that you kind of learned about later and said, we need to start making sure people are aware of how important this is? I think right immediately after when we lost Riv was when we started hearing all the drowning statistics that we didn't know, that it was the number one cause of accidental death for, for children one to four, that it's quick and silent, that it happens during most non-swim times. Like it's not usually when you're swimming. People will say, well, watch your kids. Well, yeah, it's in the seconds after dinner when they're just playing outside or it's in the seconds when you go to the restroom and they sneak out a door um, that the statistics are it's mostly white males around three years old, um, that puddle jumpers give children a false sense of security, which all my children wore puddle jumpers because I thought I was protecting them when really There's the things you, let's see, you not put, water wings, but oh, the, like the, um, band around you that you clip. Yes. You put the, it's a band around you with the little water, uh, with the little floaties oh, on the side attached. Yeah. That's yeah. what my kids wore. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So those, I was putting my children in the drowning position, which is vertical. And so they would, it gives them a muscle memory where they think, oh, if they, if we get in the water, I'm just going to float when really they just go straight down. So I think that started um, very shortly after was where we wanted to say all the things that we didn't know. And, and that's what I hear from most moms is I just didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know I had the number one killer in my backyard. Right. You know, and so we just wanted to share that with, with so many people. Wow. And that's just become part of your, your core message as well to making, I guess, and of course with summer coming up, now is a great time to remind people, I guess there's a website where they can go and, and probably find somewhere that teaches specific training to this in wherever yes. their city is, right? Yes. There's ndpa.gov. Okay. Um, and then there's also infantswim.com and you can search for a, a swim instructor in your area. I didn't know that babies could learn to roll and float at six months old. Oh, I'm amazed by that. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought, you know, we were told from when we were young, you just give your children swim lessons at three or four. They'll be fine. Well, that's too late. That's too wow. late. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Maverick took his first lessons at eight months. He took his second set at 20 months and we're about to go back and he is you should see him in the bathtub. I mean, he's under the water swimming, kicking, and he's not even, he's two and a half. So it's, it's been really neat to watch. Yeah. That's special. Tell me what is coming up next for the Smith family. What all have you got on your plate these days? 
goodness. Um, lots of travel, lots of speaking, lots of getting to meet other families walking through kind of the same grief. Um, we're, we are going to take some family vacations this year, which is going to be nice to get to spend time together. Um, I am in the process of writing my book um, about kind of my side of the grief and and hope through suffering, which I feel like is just a message that people need to hear. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think what else, what else, what else? And then just sharing, you know, water safety, like I try to do every single year. For sure. When do you expect maybe your book to be ready? Or is this the beginnings of the process or... It's the beginning. So I have to turn it in. Um, it's due September. So I guess after that, it'll be released in 2025. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. And again, just um, so impressed by you guys and your willingness to share your story. And, um, you know, I almost felt guilty going and I'm like, is there a way to do this interview and not use the phrase, take me back to June 2019? Because well, I, I know. know that that has to be so difficult, you know, to reawaken the details of that day every time, you know, you do an interview such as this. So thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been lovely to get to talk to you. I can't wait for your book. (laughs) Maybe we'll talk again when that comes out. I would love that. I would love that. Well, thank you so much. Tell Granger hello. And um, I just appreciate you guys as a couple and the way that you um, publicly are so bold in your faith. And it's such a blessing to so many other people. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This was such an important conversation, and I'm going to link to the Swim Safety websites in the show notes, as well as to Granger's book, which is really awesome, and to Amber's podcast. You can support our podcast by supporting our sponsors. They allow us to bring you these episodes at no cost each week, and we're just so grateful for them. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and to our YouTube page where you can watch these episodes. We love having you along for the journey. I simply cannot stop looking at all of the beautiful pictures from Connor and Leah's wedding. All the details were so perfect, including the awesome suits that Connor and the groomsmen wore. We ordered from suitshop.com and paid less to own and keep the suits than what we would have paid to rent them. They also have tuxes and so many color options, fit options, and everything was done online. Suit Shop managed the entire process for our group and they just couldn't have made it any easier. One of the Groomsman sent me a text last week to tell me that he has worn his suit twice since last month's wedding and another ordered two more for work because the fit was so perfect. Visit suitshop.com, use the code GIFMM for Got It From My Mama and get a free tie with purchase.